Hey there, welcome to Painter 2.5.0. So in this video, I will be introducing to you the interface and also importing the model. So to quickly start, I'm going to go into File, New, and then under Mesh, Select, select the model that you're interested in, press OK. Now this just uh, pointed the path to the model, but it hasn't actually loaded it yet. As you can see, nothing's loading. Uh, that won't happen until you press the OK button. Uh, document resolution, I like to start low, right? I don't like to go to like 4K right away because, well, I just don't. I like to keep the file as small as possible and then work up from there. It'll be a little bit more efficient. Uh, DirectX, just because it's the more popular option. And then import mesh normals and bake maps for all materials. I like to leave this off because I'm going to have Painter bake all the maps for me. But if you have some that were pre-made, go ahead. In my case, I have a lot of objects on this asset and I you know, don't want to bother baking out all, every single one of them. And then just press OK. Now, the one thing actually before I press OK, uh, create a texture set per UDEM tile. Now, I've made a video on this uh, before, but I'm going to actually be expanding a little bit and showing you the entire process of starting with uh, UDEM, painting it uh, inside of uh, Painter, then exporting those uh, UDEM tiles, and then finally rendering them. But to show you quickly, if I go over to Modo, uh, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's on this grid, there's a bunch of squares, right? And there's UVs, or rather polygons, or well, they are UVs really because they're in, in the UV, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, coordinate system. Uh, these polygons, when they're unwrapped, they land inside one of these squares. And every single one of these squares uh, allows me to have a single texture for color here, and then this square here will have uh, a separate color texture and then so on and so on. So I can have many color textures, many smaller color textures uh, for every single one of these objects. At the same time, reflection and bump and the rest of you know that uh, those textures. So really when Painter, when you look at Painter, you'll see this texture set list. When I imp create a texture set per UDEM tile, what that means, it's going to create a texture set uh, per UDEM. So I'm going to get a UDEM called 1001, 1002, 1003, and so on, until it's gone through the entire model. And then it'll create a set of textures per every single one of those, right? So let me just click OK just to start loading the model. But basically what that means is that for every single one of these, I'm going to get one color texture, one roughness, one uh, reflectivity map, one bump or normal, one opacity, and so on. And then, so for every single one of them, I'm going to get that. The reason why I use this, and this is just standard, uh, standardly used in film, is because it allows me to work on smaller maps and not one massive map. In order for this asset to work uh, for close-ups, I would need something like a 32,000 by 32,000 texture map. The problem with that is, Either the video card doesn't support it, or it's extremely slow to work with. Because when you're working with big files, whenever you're brushing uh, on it, whenever you're brushing on, it says, on a single texture, it has to update the entire texture every single time you put your move your mouse. Right, So you move your mouse, and it has to refresh the texture with the changes. And if the texture is absolutely massive, it's going to take a very long time to go through that and make the updates. Versus if you have smaller files, it's a lot faster to update that bit of information. And remember that in Painter, you're updating your color, your reflectivity, your roughness, and all those textures all at once. Okay, so the model is here, and you'll notice that my texture li set list has in fact been updated. All right, so, and to show you very quickly, if I click on 1002 and I go to solo, you'll get this object, 1003, you'll get that object, and so on. So. I've UV mapped these objects in a way where generally an entire collection of objects actually fell into a single UDEM. Okay, and I've made a few little mistakes like with these balls, but it's really not interesting because it's mostly a static object in this case. Okay, so I'm going to go back to all, and usually what I like to do is when I'm working, I like to work in solo, and then every now and then I press all to view the model and see how the colors are relative to its surroundings. Okay, so now if I press the Alt key and then press left click, I can tumble around. If I press Alt and middle click, I can uh, pan around. And if I press Alt right click, I can zoom in and out. 
If I press Control right click, I can change the brush size. If I press Control left click, I can change the opacity. And those really are the most important hotkeys that you're probably going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you should have noticed when I held a key for a little while, right, one of the modifier keys, that there was a little pop-up over here. If I do that again, if I press and hold Alt, you'll notice that there's a pop-up menu that shows up. And it shows you the hotkeys, which is great. Control, same thing. Shift, same thing. Shift, Control, I'll show you that. Shift, or Control, Alt, we'll show you that. And Shift, Alt, we'll show you that. Now, that also works for a bunch of other keys, right? Like, for example, if I press and hold Q, it'll work. But it doesn't work for everything, right? Because if I hold, for example, W, you'll notice that something's changing here. But if I press and hold W, no, that menu does, never actually pops up. So just know that it doesn't work for every single hotkey, for every single function. But, um, but it does definitely work for Shift, Control, and Alt. Um, so if you ever need to brush up on your hotkeys, they're right there. Okay, so we know how to navigate, we know how to uh, change our brush size and things like that, and we know how to change our objects, or rather our UDEMs, to paint on a separate part of an, of an object. So let us talk about the layers. Now the layers are pretty much, they work pretty much the same way as in Photoshop. You take a color and then you stack another color and then you stack another color onto it. So to quickly run you through this, uh, if you just go to the paint bucket, this thing right here, the paint bucket plus, click on it, and it'll create a new layer. And to change the color of this layer, you have to go into the properties fill, so follow my mouse over here, and down by the base color, base uniform color, you can change the color by clicking here and selecting something else. Now, I have the entire model visible. I want to simplify things, so I'm going to go into the texture set list, and I'm going to then go into solo, and I'll be viewing only that object. So I filled in a single color, and now you'll notice that it's still black in here, but that's because my channel that I'm viewing right now is set to metallic. I'm going to go back to base color, and this will turn to red, as you can see here. Now, uh, if I do that again, and I fill another color, right, on top of that, it's the gray color, and as you can see, it actually flooded the entire uh, object with that entire color. Um, if I go back into base uniform color and I change it to something like yellow, yellowish green in this case, so something more like that, uh, it'll again flood that, uh, you know, the, the canvas with that, rather the object with that. So <clears throat> I have yellow and red. Now, if I want to see the red, Again, just like in Photoshop, you have to create a mask. So right click, in my case, I had a uh, white mask, and nothing will change until you actually start painting on it. So back in the properties paint, I'm going to choose a value, and black in this case works. I'm going to paint on the object, and you'll notice that right away it reveals the layer below. But for the most part, if you want, I mean, if you want to work manually, you'll be basically working with layers and right-clicking and adding uh, things like that, right? So generators, uh, you can manually paint, fill, and so on. Uh, but if you want to work a little bit faster and use the power of Painter a little bit more um, fully, then really what you should be doing is using these smart materials. So if I create, if I use this machinery material and I drag over to the very top, you'll notice something like this, which is not much yet. But that's because this material, if you open it up, has a lot of layers. And if you go into here, you'll have, see like MG Mask Editor. If you'll click on any one of these, sometimes they might have also some options. In this case, it's mostly just the MG Mask material. But some of these uh, mask uh, builders, uh, what they use is they use maps from here, okay, from this texture set settings. So this smart material needs support. And in order for it to really show you the uh, what this material looks like, which really should be looking like this icon, and if I leave my mouse over this icon, it should update. See, it, it gives you a little pop up with a larger thumbnail. So basically, that's kind of the look that it, this material should give you. But this is not what we got. So if we go to bake textures, you'll get this menu here. And I usually like to set things to 2048 to start. Um, just know that this is the resolution that the texture mask will be baked at, but doesn't mean that this is the actual texture resolution of the textures. Okay, We can increase and decrease this at a later time. 
And I like to keep things by default, or uh, usually. Um, I don't really change much in here. And you have two options. You can either bake all texture sets, which will bake all these texture sets at once, so one after another, after another, after another, until it's done. Or just bake an individual one, which is the bake 101, which is basically the one that I have selected. In my case, I'm going to select 1001 textures. And the reason being is that this model is very large. So two reasons. It's, it's large and it's going to take a very long time. And two, uh, if it actually bakes all these uh, materials or all these textures for every single one of those texture sets, and there's again, there's a lot of texture sets uh, right away, at this resolution, 2048, then it's actually going to make the file balloon a lot. I don't want that. I want to I want to make the file swell slowly. OK, so I can then, if, if for example, if an object like this one here doesn't really need to be 2048, if I can get away with something like 1024, then I'm going to use that resolution. If I can get away with 512 for a certain object, then I'll use that. Right? There's no reason to, I mean, 512, the difference between 512 and uh, 1024 is not double the size. It's actually four times the size. And 2048 is four, uh, is four times the size of 1024. And it, and it keeps going, you know, it keeps being multiplied by four. So the textures are getting four times bigger every single time you go up one of these. All right. So imagine now you have a thickness map, position map, curvature, occlusion, and normals. Every single one of them is being increased by four times. Your file size ends up getting very, very big very quickly. For game models, all texture sets is fine, but generally you want to bake these things individually uh, if you can, at least in 2017 still, because the video cards can only handle so much, and you only have so much RAM generally in our workstation. So I'm going to go into 2048, in my case, bake textures, and uh, yeah, so as we're going to be baking, you'll notice that this will change slightly, this object here. And the reason why is because as it's processing these, it's going to put them inside of here, and then automatically, as those textures are being processed, once they're done process being processing or processed, they're being input into the smart material. So, and as you can see, once all these supporting maps have been populated, the machinery material, the smart material, has actually made use of these textures, and it looks pretty good. Now, there's one more thing that I have to mention here, is that we bake those textures out at 2K, but the my rendering right now is done at 1K. If I take this and change it to 2K, it's going to render this at 2K. And as you can see, there was quite a significant upgrade in quality, right? So if I go back to 1K, it'll look like that. If I go to 2K, it'll look like that. And what if I go to 4K? It's going to rebake, and there's this little progress bar at the very bottom, and it's going to bake this material, or everything, until it looks like that, which is very nice. It's nice and sharp, but it's a little bit unnecessary at this point because it's also much slower to work with. So I'm just going to go back to 2K. This gives me more performance, four times the performance, quite frankly. Um, and I can still see the result very well. So that's pretty much what the uh, layers do, and texture sets and texture set settings. There's a few th more things, though. Uh, under the texture set settings, channels, you can actually add new channels, right? So if by default you have color, metallic, roughness, normal, height, and opacity, or actually you don't have opacity because I added that myself, right? So by, by default you have something like this. So if you want opacity, if you want to make things transparent, then you would do it here. So press the plus, select opacity, and now you have a new channel. And then here, you can select what quality, and do you want it to be RGB, or do you want it to be only a shade, right? Um, or like a gray value, and then do you want it to be 8-bit, uh, 16-bit, and 16-bit F, which basically means float, right? Or 32-bit float, right? So you have many options here. You can paint things in RGB, so you can have three values for here, but you really shouldn't do that. You should keep it, um, especially if it's going to be a regular black and white mask, uh, you want to leave it as black and white. And the reason why is because later on in the process, when you're baking these textures, you'll be able to put opacity, roughness, and metallic all in a single texture and a height. Okay, So that's the benefit of using single channel. So basically, this is going to bake a single channel, single channel, single channel, single channel, 
and then you can compress all these into a single map. Versus the base color sRGB, there's going to be uh, an RGB and A, right? So there's going to be at least three values being populated by this one mask, or by, by this one channel. So that's that. So now let's talk about uh, a few more things. One of which is if we go down over here, you'll see texture set settings, you'll see display settings and viewer settings. So this whole time we've been working inside of a tab, right? So you can actually have menus stacked on top of one another, but then you can reveal the ones that are underneath. If we go to viewer settings, the cool thing about this menu here uh, is it's going to be a little bit harder to see on, on here versus if I actually show the entire model. So under texture set list, I'm going to click all and I'll navigate to something like that. And now I'm going to view the environment map. So right now I have the elevator corridor uh, enabled. That's the one that's the lighting situation that that's the lighting conditions that I'm using from right now. And if I go to environment capacity and I turn it on, Okay, and I blur it less, you'll notice that this is an actual environment that I've loaded in. All right, so I can navigate around it. And it's getting the lighting information from this. Now, I can change it to something else, right? And generally, I won't actually texture with anything that's got too much color. Reason being is that some of that color will actually bleed into the surface, and then you don't really know what you're painting. Right? You could be painting something that looks like red, but actually could be blue. Probably won't be that like that, but I mean, but it's, it is going to affect your color in the end. Right, if I, for example, choose this one here, it's turned this sort of like a bluish uh, tint, and I don't want that, right? Sometimes it's actually detrimental to the actual end result. So what I like to do is I like to use this airport, or something that's a little bit more even. Uh, the studio ones are also pretty good because they're just white, right? They're very simple. Um, and then this way, you can, f you can use these to focus on very simple things, right? Color highlights and things like that without actually affecting your color too much. I Again, I, I like to use the airport one, but this one comes from the Substance uh, Designer, right? At least I didn't see it in my uh, Painter 2. I think it used to be in Painter 1, though. I don't quite remember, but I remember it, using it a long, long time ago. So I basically just imported a whole bunch of, uh, uh, what do you call it, HDRs that I find useful uh, in here, and I just use them, right? So, but anyways, the airport one I feel is very nice because it's a nice overcast, even grayish color. It doesn't really affect your model in any really negative way. Uh, and then once I need to, for example, paint things like reflections and uh, and things like that, then I switch up the uh, airport to something like elevator, right? And then, then this will give me more intensity uh, to work with because as you can see, there's a lot of, there's a strong light coming from this part of the, uh, the environment. And then that'll show me the highlights traveling on the actual model. And then the cool thing is that I can just, if I want to see how this model reacts to moving light, then I just rotate the environment. And in order for it to be less distracting, what I'll usually do is I will blur the environment like that, or even just turn it off entirely, so turn down the opacity. And then I'll just rotate it to see how the, if I just rotate the lights around the model, I can see how the highlights and, you know, and the material overall reacts to moving light. So that's pretty much what I would do in here. Then under the display settings, uh, you can usually basically just, um, if, if you activate this, you can do a few things. You can change your camera, and then you can change things like your depth of field, tone mapping, glare, and you know, things like that to basically make it give you a more filmic kind of look. So you'll generally find these in higher end uh, game engines. So if you want to preview what it might look like in your game engine, then you could do that. All right, so lens distortion, as an example, All right? You can add some vignette, some glare. Glare is kind of cool because what it what it'll do is it'll create like a lens flare, All right? You can not really see it so much here until you whoa, blast it just like that. So next up is the toolbar, right up top over here, and you'll find a few things. You'll find shortcuts to, for example, substance share. Right, if I click on it uh, and then I'll hover over any one of these icons, you'll actually see what, what it is. So Substance Share Website, Substance Source, uh, and then you'll have a bunch of tools. Now these tools don't actually always highlight, right? So right now, as you can see, they're nice and white, and then these triangles are white also. That means I can actually use these. 
if I were to go into the layers menu and then click on machinery here, right, the, my uh, smart material, you'll notice that all these gray out. And if I click on them, nothing actually happens. So in order for you to be able to use some of the tools, you actually have to be on a paintable layer. So if I try to go over my viewport and I try to click and paint somewhere, it says you cannot paint. That's because this is not a paintable layer. This is a collect. This is a preview of the entire material. Now, if I click on this layer, the, uh, the paint bucket layer, same thing will happen. It's not a paintable layer. This is a layer that automatically floods the texture with a single color or a material. And if I go to Rust, this mask is actually a paintable layer. Now you can see my cursor, but at the same time, you can see uh, the tools actually being not grayed out anymore, right? So now they're enabled. And you can tell that by the white triangle, right? So whenever I go in here, the triangle is black or dark gray. If I go onto Rust, and if I go into my mask, it's a paintable layer. So now I can, um, you know, now I can actually use these tools. So you have your paintbrush, right? And if you click on it, that, you can choose paint or physical paint. You can use the eraser, right, or physical eraser, and so on, right? So there's a bunch of options uh, in a bunch of these tools. Whenever there's a triangle, there's more brushes there. Over here, we have things to manipulate our viewport and our cameras. So here you have the uh, the viewport type, right? So here you have a 3D, 2D, so you can see your texture and your viewport, 3D only or 2D only. So depending on what it is that you need, you can change your configuration. And uh, then you have here the constraining, right? So you can either have a completely free camera or a constrained camera, and you can change between pr uh, perspective or, or uh, ortho. And here you have the iRay renderer. iRay renderer basically is just like a, it's, it's a render, right? That you have inside of like Maya, for example. Um, in my case, I'm not really going to use it a bit. Well, here's the thing: so if I if I click it, it's going to have to spin up, right? So it's going to have to um, uh, what do you call it? Warm up and like import all the textures and things like that. And then you'll have a viewport that it's going to render inside, and you're going to have all these different settings to give you to allow you to then render and save out uh, still images that look a lot nicer than, for example, if you were to do it in a regular 3D viewport. In order to exit, just press that button here again, rendering IRA, and you'll be thrown right back into the uh, OpenGL or uh, DirectX uh, viewport. So next up, let's talk about the um, customization. So finally, as far as the um, customization goes, it's very simple, right? You take the header of any one of these menus, right? So you have layers, texture set settings, properties, and texture uh, set list. You can take any one of them, click on them, and drag them to another part of the application. So for example, I like to have my texture set lists on the left. So I'm just going to drag it over there. And you've noticed right away that the closer I get, right? So if my mouse moves to a part of the app, it'll actually make room for that menu. So I can just le let go of my left click and it'll drag or it'll drop the menu over there. Uh, another thing I like to do is I like to generally keep my uh, viewer settings over there as well, right? So if I go over below, it'll make again room for that menu and display settings as well. I'm just gonna put it on top of this one though, right? And now what you've noticed is that it actually created a tab. So if you drop drag and drop a menu on top of a menu, it'll create a tab. But if you if you go towards the corners, the edges rather, of that menu, then it'll make space for that menu. Now, personally, I like to move the properties paint off to another monitor. But in this case, because it is a tutorial, I want you guys to see everything. But anyways, this allows me to keep things like that. I don't use this menu as often, right? So, and it allows me to keep the texture list a little bit bigger than it was here. And then it also allows me to have the properties basically fill up most of the space vertically, right? So I can see more properties this way. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't use the texture settings as much. I mean, I, I can probably just use about that much of it, right? Or maybe even that much. So at least I know if, if, it, if I have a supporting uh, maps for that particular texture set, right? And then it allows me to also change interactively my uh, texture resolution render right, or rather display at any given time. And it also gives me a little bit more room for the layers. 
So that's pretty much it, I mean, as far as the customization goes and pretty much about this video. So I've gone through the interface, like what the layers do, the properties, I mean, that's self-explanatory, texture set settings, uh, display, texture sets, uh, viewer settings. Uh, I've gone over the shelf a little bit, right? You, you can find all sorts of like presets there uh, and resources like textures. Uh, I've gone over the uh, pop-up menus that show up whenever you're trying to navigate, the hotkeys to navigate to begin with, uh, the toolbar, and finally the customization. So this video was really meant to be kind of like a quick boot camp, kind of like an introductory video uh, into Painter, so that at least you'd know uh, what happens. For example, like how sort of how the uh, layers work, um, what happens with the supporting maps, uh, and then when you have to bake in order to actually see your final uh, smart material result, right? Otherwise, you're not going to see the result that you're expecting when you drag and drop uh, a layer. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So in the next videos, what I will be doing is I'll be going over this model and applying certain materials and doing a little bit of look dev with just basic materials, but without actually painting on anything, right? So I'll be baking and applying colors. And then once I go over the entire asset, uh, then I'll actually do some painting.